this particular chapter sometimes gets overlooked. It's in one of the more beloved books. John is a book that a lot of people, if you ask them what their favorite book in the Bible is, you're going to get a lot of responses that say John. John 4, however, is not one of the more popular, although people talk about it, but you talk about chapters like John 1, chapter 3, chapter 6, but John 4 sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. Really, truth be told, all of them take a backseat to John 1 and John 3 and John 6, but John 4 is interesting. There's some important points that are brought up in John 4, and so let's go ahead and look at it. Therefore, verse 1, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had searched Jesus or searched out for Jesus because he was making more uh, disciples and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. So the Pharisees were jealous. They didn't like the fact that someone was taking a little bit of publicity, a little bit of shine, a little bit of whatever away from them. The limelight, the attention was not focused on them and people were following. He was doing more for them than the Pharisees ever even wanted to do. And so he says he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called... Now, this point right here, here's an issue where it says, and he had to pass through uh, Samaria. The word that's used here for had, it's necessary, a day, which is, uh, it's necessary. The question is, is he saying that he needed to go through Samaria? Samaria was the shortest route to get to where he was going. But I'm wondering, I'm thinking that that's not the, the point of this, that he needed to because it was the shortest distance. Because Jews typically, even though it was the shortest distance, would just simply go around. It was just the normal track to take. It's almost like saying, let's cut across the raging river uh, through the volcanoes just so we can get there. No, you would just go around. And I use those because Jews and Samaritans have no dealings with each other. They did not like each other. As a matter of fact, there's an old saying, especially concerning Samaritan women, that they would treat the Samaritan women as though that they were continuously menstruating. And so, you know, for Jews, that was, we have to stay away from her because she is unclean. Well, they looked at women, particularly in the reason why I bring it up, because he's going to talk with a woman. But sometimes they looked at the, the men also. That's just kind of the, the tense relationship that they had with Samaritans. So going back to it, verse 5 says, so, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. This is intentional. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being weary from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So it's at a time where people are coming to the well. Uh, they're coming to fill up their water and to take their water back. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, which was odd. Now, apparently, I don't know how this was done, but you could tell who was a Jew and who was a Samaritan. She recognized that he was a Jew and clearly him being in Samaria, him being Jesus also, there's, there's clear recognition that this is a Samaritan woman. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered, here we go. He said to her, uh, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew what God was giving and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In other words, don't focus on me asking you to give water. You need to be. You need to understand who I am. If you knew who I was, then you would be asking me to give you this living water. Remember, this is where Jacob's well is. So he's trying to make a point. But oh, by the way, who is Jacob? Now the Samaritans they go as far as what we call the Pentateuch. They believe in the Pentateuch. There might be some slight changes in certain part, portions of it, but in the Pentateuch, the, the Samaritan Pentateuch is a little bit different, and one of them happens to be where they worship it. We'll talk about that in a second, but they, they listen to, they believe that the first five books of the Bible are reliable, that they are from God, the Pentateuch. Same thing with the Jews. And so what they are referring to they have that in common, Jews and Samaritans. And so he's piggybacking off of the fact that they're at this well. 
And who did Jacob in this land meet? Well, Jacob got a chance to meet who? God face to face. And so here we have something that maybe she should probably be thinking about. There's gonna, he's going to say some things to her that's going to cause some wheels in her head to start turning. She said to him, sir, <clears throat> you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? And notice the water is described as living. She's intrigued, but she doesn't quite understand because she's thinking that he's speaking about some sort of physical water. She says, you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Well, point of fact, yes, ma'am, I am. Uh, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. Now, I want to look at some of the words that are used and how these are phrased out. Now, this is where you're going to see a condition here, this hasda'an, or, and really, you don't really focus on the the uh, the delta. This is what's called a post-positive rather than saying dia. Uh, this would shift to the front, so it's has on or has down. It doesn't really matter, but the has who on. This is non-translated, but this is whoever. If a person were to drink out of the water that I am given, that I am given, that I will give. I'm sorry, this is doso, so this is a future tense. Whoever's going to drink of this water, the water is not there, but it will be. Whoever drinks of this water, look what he says. Ume dipsese, which is to say they will never, ever, ever thirst again. So once they drink of this water that he's going to give, he says in the most emphatic way, they will never, ever, ever, this is a future active indicative, negating a future active indicative, so they will never in the future thirst. Why is that important? Because what is he speaking of? Well, we know already that he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. So the first time that you drink of the Holy Spirit, the first time that you partake of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, once you drink of this water that I'm going to give you, you will never, ever, ever thirst again. That is vitally important. By the way, we've just got through speaking about the Holy Spirit and used synonymously with water in the previous chapter in John 3. Jesus says that you must be born of water and spirit. And this also harkens back to Ezekiel 36, when God says that I will, I will sprinkle clean water on them, wash their hearts, put my spirit in them. And so this imagery that we're thinking of, this water, you'll see it used synonymously, water and spirit. And so this water that he's speaking of, he says, once you partake of this water, this water that is living, the Holy Spirit, you will never, ever thirst again. We cannot let that be lost because that tells us something about our salvation, the length of it. Can it be lost? Well, in this case, going by just a, just a gr grammatical construction here, the grammar, it cannot be. They will never, ever thirst again. Now, this is the future active indicative, so they'll never, ever thirst again in the future. Look what he says. Eyes ton Iona, which is into the ages or into eternity. Eternally, you will never, ever, ever. And so we can't take it to say that, well, that's once you get into eternity. That's once you get to heaven, then you'll never thirst. No, this is prior to heaven going into heaven. But the water um, that I will give to him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So what is this water going to come to or become? Eternal life. That part is significant. And this is why this is an underappreciated uh, set of verses here that we should never let escape. Now, the woman is still confused. Some things are going in her head and she's still a bit confused. And she says, thinking this is real water, physical water that she's used to. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so I will never will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. I don't like making this trip. And so this way, I don't want to have to thirst. She's not quite getting it. She's Her interest is peaked, but she's not quite getting it. He said to her, call your husband and come. Now, I want you to notice something that he says here. Call your husband and come. The woman said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said I have no husband. Now, I want you to see something that you can't see. And when I say I want you to see what you can't see, I mean to show you something in the Greek. What he says to her gets her to kind of grabs her attention, makes her look at, look at something. What he said, what she says in verse 17, you think in the, now in the English, it looks like he said what she said verbatim. He did not. He said, she said to her, to him, I have no husband. How it's written in the Greek is uk echo. Andra. Now, it's correct that 
word order doesn't always matter, but sometimes it does, especially when you move words around to offer some sort of emphasis. She says, and remember this phrase, uk echo andra. She says, not I have a husband. Jesus said to her a little bit different. Well, it's good that you said because, and look what he says. He says, andra uk echo. She says, uk echo andra, not I have a husband. Jesus says, a husband, not I have. It's good that you said that, a husband. Jesus moves the emphasis, puts the word andra, husband, to the front of that statement. So he's indicating, you're right, a husband you don't have, but the one that you do have for, you've had five of them, but the one that you are having now, um, who you have, is not your husband. So immediately when he makes that statement, she's thinking, wait a minute, hold on. Am, it's almost like, am I being punked? Is some, is, is someone, did someone send you here? Do you know me? Do I know you? She says to him, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Really? Yeah. Uh, a prophet amongst all prophets, a Lord amongst all Lords. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, if we were to read their version of the Pentateuch, the Samaritan Pentateuch, they believe that someone like an Ezra, someone changed the words from Mount Gerizim, where they are, where they worship, where they think the Lord is going to come back to, to uh, Mount Sinai. But they're incorrect. Now, Jesus brings up something that it's not even so much about the place you're going to worship. Now, you guys don't even know what you really are worshiping, which is true. The Samaritans, as bad as the Jews are in terms of how they've been, how they behave in terms of following God, uh, the Samaritans are even worse. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, uh, an hour is coming when, when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. The salvation's coming is coming from the Jews, not through the Samaritans who are cousins of the Jews who are just the least Jewish type Jews that there could ever be. They are, there, there's a reason where there's this hatred for them. They are viewed as almost like traitors. They are um, physically, ethnically like them who turned around and intermarried with other nations, other groups. Uh, now, did the Jews do that also? Yeah, they did. But at least the Jews would try to maintain some semblance of what they were told to do in terms of following the law, not the Samaritans. But he says, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, we cover this issue about worship, what this word is, this word proskuneia. Uh, this word worship carries two things. One, it's a bowed down sense of uh, honor and adoration, looking, feeling lowly at a person that you esteem a lot higher. But it also, when we talk about this word worship, because it's the very same word that's used here when we go back to the Old Testament, the word that's used there, if we look at the, the Greek Septuagint, the word that's used there is to serve. And so there's a combination of us in a bowed down, humble sense in serving the Lord. And so that's what Jesus is pulling out here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him how? In spirit and in truth. In other words, not just in spirit, but also in truth. And I think we miss that. Trying to worship God with a bad or a false or faulty understanding of who he is, is not real worship. It, in other words, if you're worshiping a God who you think is also the God of Islam, the God of Hindu, that's not the God that you worship. That's not the true God. If you worship a God who thinks that there are many paths to salvation to be saved, you're not really worshiping. So you must worship him, not just in spirit, but in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. So they understand this point. They just don't understand the point. That's his, that's Jesus's point. Uh, he who, who, he who was called the Christ, uh, when the one comes, he will declare all things to us. So they know that they are lacking some things. And so they're waiting for this declarative word coming from the Messiah. Jesus said, makes a statement, and sometimes it gets lost in English as well. He says to her, I who speak to you am he. Well, how did he say so? Uh, he says, Lege ate hi Jesus. Look what he says, ego 
M A I M He. It's the very same word that, that you can identify with or anyone, whether they be Jews or Samaritans reading the Pentateuch. Remember, Moses speaks with the ego M A, the I am. He speaks with the one that says I am. And so he gives his emphasis to the I am. And so what does she do? She's astonished, she's shocked, and then she leaves. Wonderful reaction, right? Well, she didn't just leave just because she's leaving. She leaves now to go and tell someone. Now, just for the soap opera stuff, the disciples show back up. And they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman, and not just any woman, a Samaritan woman, which makes sense they're in Samaria. But you're speaking with this woman? Jesus, what gives? He says, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went to the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ. Is, it, is this the Christ? She's wondering aloud, speculating, this might be. Is it? I, I think he's a prophet. Now, what all did he tell her? Did he tell her? Did, did he literally tell her everything about herself? No, but certainly the, the important things. Now, we don't have an idea if this was the complete conversation that was told here. If he went through some other things, we don't know. All we have is just what we have. And so she makes a statement either in a hyperbolic sense or she might be, maybe she is telling the truth. But she says that um, after, after he tells them that, uh, she says, come see a man. They went out of the city and were coming to him. Well, in the meantime, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. And he said, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything, did it? Sometimes disciples, they're just like us. They're, they're human, just like us. And sometimes they just miss everything. They're just dense. He says, uh, they're, they're saying, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him or who sent me to accomplish his work. That's what I live off of. That's my point. That's my purpose. You guys are worried about these things. And while food has its place, that's not the goal. That's not the point. Um, we won't starve here. We are going to accomplish at least I will accomplish what I've been sent to do. Do you not say uh, there are yet four months and then comes a harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Jesus, what in the world are you speaking of? Well, what did Jesus just get through doing before they showed up? He was having a conversation. Well, he showed, they showed up seeing the end of the conversation. What did he witness? What did they witness? They witnessed him speaking to who? This Samaritan woman. And then Jesus goes into about uh, the, his food is to do the Father's will. And they say, well, have you eaten yet? Well, I, my food is to do the Father's will. I, I, I'm being fed now. And what do you mean? Who brought you some food? And then Jesus seems to divert and go to something else about the harvest and the harvest is being, is white right now. It's ripe. It's ready to be received. What are you talking about, Jesus? For this is the case, this case, uh, I'm sorry, for in this case, the saying is true. One sows, another reap. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So what are you speaking of, Jesus? You're talking about a lot of different things. Well, what are we here for, ladies and gentlemen, disciples? You, you fellas, what are we here for? Why are we going to where, to where we're going to? Why are we even going through Samaria? Why are we doing these things? Not just to get our names written in the book. There's a point to this. Our job, what we're trying to accomplish is bringing in people. So what you guys are doing, you are going to be used. Remember, I said, I want you guys to be fishers of men. Well, you are going to reap where others have sown and others are going to sow where you have reaped. And already there is already a reaping that is taking place. The harvest is ripe right now. So as they're sitting there puzzled, scratching their heads, trying to figure this out, the men from the Samaritans show up from, from, from Samaria, from that same city, verse 39, many of the Samaritans believed in him because the word of the woman who testifies. So that tells us that a woman does have the ability to share a word to say to speak about what god has doing or in this case about jesus women can do so again we don't believe that a woman can do so in an official capacity let's say as a pastor or elder but could they do so just speaking to men there's someone that's lost you mean tell me you can't tell a woman can't tell a man about the goodness of the lord if a man is misunderstanding something she can't defend the gospel she absolutely can 
You just can't do it in, a, in the place of leadership, teaching over man, usurping over man. And so uh, he told me all the things that I've done. That's what she said to them. And so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. So he's not interested in just going through Samaria. He's interested in going to Samaria, which takes us back to the very beginning when, when he says that we need or there is a need to go through Samaria. The reason for the need was not to go through, but to go to Samaria. Why? There are some people there. Remember, Jesus sent them also before another time and the people were not receiving them. And remember what the response was from, I think it was John and James, I think, or Peter and James. Lord, shall we call fire down? And I could just imagine Jesus just shaking his head. You don't know what these are talking about. These people are eventually going to be on our side. We'll get to that in just a second. But he says, many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. That is vitally important for them to make that statement because there's only one savior, that this one, this person, that this one is the savior of the world. And then after two days, he went forth from there into Galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. So now we've got Jesus going to Galilee, the reason why he makes his statement, because these are not faithful people. They only want what they want, and they really don't care whose hands it's at. They'll follow pretty much whomever. And so verse 46, therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made water and wine. So almost like returning to the scene of the crime, his first miracle there. Uh, and there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. That's what he says, though. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will never, ever, ever believe. These people, those people. And now, guess what? Also, in this most emphatic way, um, he says the possibility of you seeing, I mean, of you believing, won't happen unless you see a sign. How, how, how sad is that? And there are people like that. He says, Ume Pistusete, which is you just don't have the possibility. The possibility of you believing uh, is gone unless you see a sign. However, you will see a sign. For you people, you will see a sign, which will be what? His death, burial, and resurrection. Now, he's actually going to show them a sign. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. He said to him, go, your son lives. Go, your son is, think about how powerful that is. Go, your son lives. Right then there, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. And as he was going down, his slaves met him saying that his son was living. So he inquired, well, when, what time did this happen? And recognized that this was the time that Jesus said that. So uh, the father knew that it was the hour which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is a second time a second sign that Jesus performed when he came out of Judea into Galilee. So let's pause and stop there. The important points that we got to hear is what Jesus, the reason why Jesus is going there. And he's telling them about this living water. Now, the reason why we have this statement, the reason why Jesus seems to go off on a different, a different uh, rabbit trail or speak about something that's unrelated. It is related. Jesus is there to do what, what he was sent to do. Well, he says that you guys are going to also reap where you didn't sow. What do you mean by that? You're going to reap where you didn't sow. Well, Jesus is laying this foundation in Samaria, in this same region, in the same land, where, oh, by the way, they are they 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 preach about Jacob, but Jacob met the Lord and wrestled with him in, in Genesis. And so we come forward. This is where Jacob left this well for us. And now you have a better water. Yes, I do this living water. And so what, what does he do? He explains to her and she understands who he is. These people, these Samaritans from this little city come and they believe on him. So the foundation is being laid. How then does that relate to them 
reaping where someone else is sowing. Well, Jesus is laying the foundation here. He's sowing. He's putting a seed down. They are going to reap this. When and how are they going to reap this? Well, let's go to Acts. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus makes a statement. They ask, well, when are you going to restore the kingdom? He said, hush up. I'm not talking about that right now. Don't worry about that. Those times and epochs that the Lord has determined. He said, though, but just wait a little bit. And what will you do? You will receive power or the ability when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And notice what he says. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Well, what happens? They receive the Holy Spirit and they go and they receive people from Samaria into the body. Initially, though, the Samaritans believe, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit. Until when? The very one of the very same disciples who wanted to call down fire shows up. Peter and John show up in Acts 8 in Samaria. And at them, at their laying on of hands and their validation, the Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit and become part of the church. So now they are reaping where the Lord Jesus has sown. And so now we can see, oh, that's what Jesus meant. And so he's making, as he says in John, uh, two people, two shepherd, two flocks into one with one shepherd, the Jews, as well as all the non-Jews, including the Samaritans as well as the Gentiles. And so now we can kind of see the importance of this, but don't miss on, don't, don't miss what he said earlier in John four, that once you receive the spirit, you're never, ever, ever going to thirst, even going into the ages, into eternity. And this is going to be water that is going to bring you into and cause you to have eternal life. So John four, wonderful book, wonderful story. It's not just about the Samaritans or the Samaritan woman, but about our salvation. Amen.